So welcome to Making UK Connections, Voices of the Pacific New Solidarity, in which a panel of faith and climate mitigation leaders will discuss what Pacific Island communities need most from COP26, and also how communities of faith can connect anew to amplify those calls for urgent action. This panel discussion is part of the Pacific Art Festival, a celebration of Pacific arts and culture in the lead up to COP26 that has been produced by Pacific Island Artists Connection and was hosted by St Martin in the Fields in London. This session is also part of Living God's Future Now, the online festival of theology, ideas and practice from Heart Edge. And Heart Edge itself is an international and ecumenical movement for renewal within the broad church. A network of churches growing compassionate responses to needs, cultural and commercial activities and congregational life. We'd ask those um, who are with us who are not on the panel to remain on mute unless you're invited to speak, as this minimizes background noise and enhances our recording. However, we do want you to um, write any questions or comments that you have in the chat and we will introduce as many of those as possible into the conversation as we go along. Um, so do feel free to post comments and questions as soon as they come to mind and also to use the chat as a place where you can discuss the implications of what the panelists are sharing with us. Um, we're very pleased to be joined today um, by Chris Lupton, uh, Mariana Waka, Grace Maraja, and Samson Werner, and uh, hope that uh, two other panelists will join us as we go along. Um, Chris Lupton was for 22 years General Secretary of Papua New Guinea Church Partnership a charity supporting the Anglican Church in Papua New Guinea. She was awarded a 30th anniversary of Independence Medal in 2005, and in the 1990s and early 2000s was a member of the Church's Commission on Mission Pacific Forum of Churches Together in Britain and Ireland. Chris is Secretary of the Pacific Island Society of the UK and Ireland, having served as chair and vice chair. Um, a student of theology, Mariana is a curious lifelong learner who has been working with different churches in Fiji over the last five years. She is the founder of Vunilaga Book Club, a community initiative that promotes reading and books towards the empowerment um, towards the uh, sorry, I've just lost my place towards the empowerment of uh, children in settlement and rural communities. She currently works for the Pacific Conference of Churches, where she looks after the mission on child protection and safeguarding through member churches in the Marshall Islands, the Solomon Islands, and Fiji. Grace Mirage has served the Fiji government in Geneva at the UN, at the Human Rights Council and the World Trade Organization. She represented Fiji in climate change negotiations during COP25, uh, as well as Uppsala University as an education institution. She's currently an MBA candidate at the Linnaeus University specializing in leadership and management in international contexts, while also being CEO and founder of the Arvet Agency, a media production company specializing in intellectual property rights acquisitions. Samson Verma is a Fijian and, uh, and French and is a member of the French diplomatic community currently living in Rome in Italy. He is a founding member of the New Waves Writing Collective that began at USP in the 1990s. His writing projects include a collection of personal and intimate poetry from 1998 to uh, 2005, in which he lived in France as an undocumented immigrant. 
He lectures regularly in several Paris universities and is a founding member of the Artists Collective in France, an association created in 1999 to help support and defend the rights of LGBTQI undocumented individuals, including those fleeing persecution and death in their countries due to their sexuality. Um, we have now been joined um, by Archbishop, uh, His Excellency, the Most Reverend Dr. Peter Lloyd Chong, Archbishop of Suva. Um, Archbishop Peter is the third Catholic Archbishop of Suva in Fiji. He was born in Natovi um, and became a priest uh, almost 30 years ago. He obtained his doctorate in theology at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. And as part of his awareness raising around the climate emergency, he has written a climate change lament after visiting a coal mine in Germany in 2018. This is a song that says that island people's voices should cry out for the world to disturb the big countries for causing CO2 emissions that result in sea level rises and the eventual drowning of small islands and peoples. So we have a, a tremendously varied and knowledgeable um, panel with us today. Uh, a warm welcome to you all. Um, and uh, we're going to go now to two questions. I'm going to go firstly to um, Archbishop uh, Peter and to ask what are the current challenges for your communities as a direct result of climate change in the region. Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, my apologies, I'm just a little bit late uh, uh, joining in. So in regard to your question, uh, the direct challenges of uh, climate change, as you will have known, is uh, is of course uh, uh, we. I'd like to speak of two two levels of impacts. One is the one brought about by climate change in general, but also the core, the ecological destruction that's caused within our country. So, of course, uh, sea level rising is. Uh, probably one of the most uh, uh, observable uh, impact of uh, climate change because of the uh, the melting of the ice in the north and south pole and that uh, raises the sea level and uh, so sea level is real for us uh, i can only speak right from my maternal mother's village you know uh, about 40 years ago, most of the houses were right, just right next to the seashore about, you know, you can walk uh, for a couple of meters and your house is right next to the seashore. At that time, you know, it was the civil, uh, you were considered civilized if you are living in the coastal area near the seashore because you have access to, to seafood and, uh, and, uh, you prided yourself if you, you came from co close to the sea and the coastal. But my grandfather's house got burnt about 40 years ago, and uh, his house is just close to the seashore. <clears throat> when he rebuilt his house, he did not rebuild on the same spot. He moved up to high ground. Today, most of the houses uh, have moved up uh, to higher ground. Uh, obviously, they see something happening and that the shoreline erosion and it's coming close they can see uh, uh, swamps uh, increasing around the uh, side of the village so they 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 probably did not call it the uh, sea level rising or the identify the cause as being climate change but uh, they know they see something that makes them rethink of where they build or rebuild their houses. So today, most of the houses have moved upland uh, and uh, relocated themselves there, not because, uh, you know, European Union or somebody 
or an NGO or help them, but uh, out of their own choice, they have moved uh, up. So that's uh, probably the biggest impact for us uh, island nations is the, the rising sea level. The other impact that concerns us right now because it's happening is the 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 impact of uh, most especially extractive industries and the damage that they have done to our ecosystem uh, destroying the environment the ocean the rivers uh, extractive uh, industries uh, in fiji there's a lot of uh, gravel extraction from rivers and so that has a direct impact on the lives <coughs> of people and the, the living creatures in the sea, in the rivers and uh, and also splitting villages uh, again i just go back to my home province in dawsam uh, a village called delkando is a, a, a stone quarry the biggest in fiji and they say it's also probably biggest in this in the Oceania region. But the impacts on the river is immense and how that when you take away rocks, then the, 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 the mud is loose. When there's a flood, all the silt and the mud goes into the river, the mangrove that has a big impact. And uh, it also has impact on the village. The, those who are for it and against it, uh, today the village is Split. Uh, so those who are against it have moved away from the village and re relocated somewhere else just because they do not agree with uh, that uh, that project. So it has it damages the the environment, but it also damages the social relationship of uh, clans and families. Uh, so and and this story of this village is repeated else around the islands in the in the main island in Fiji where extractive industry takes place so it's like a double effect double damaging the environment and the ocean and also the the family connections that have been built over the years and it just takes one selfish company that are after short term gain to damage this family relationship. So now I just speak for Fiji. Uh, Papua New Guinea has a, a big threat on seabed mining and other mining that's taking place there. So, but uh, that, uh, to your question, this, this would be the main threat to us, the threat of sea level rising and the, the threat that we have caused ourselves because we do not manage these extractive industries well. And I'll give them a free hand. So Jonathan, I want to keep it short. And Thank be... you. That, that's very helpful and very clear. Um, I wonder whether Mariana might be able to um, add, add to that um, as, as your role takes you across several of the different islands in the region. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, yes, I, I agree with everything that His Grace has just uh, mentioned in terms of the climate change impacts uh, here in Fiji and um, in our region. Um, I guess one of the things that um, continues to, to be a challenge is that uh, in many communities uh, at ground level, uh, whether it's urban or rural, is that uh, they are experiencing changes um, in terms of what is happening within the environment or uh, as we like to say, uh, creation. Um, the, but one of the challenges is that, um, you know, there are so many um, highly technical discussions that happen around climate change and the different types of uh, things that are affecting the region. Um, but whereas those who are actually in the communities experiencing these changes, such as 
uh, one of the ladies that I work with, she was just mentioning in uh, one of the provinces here in Fiji, uh, on, in the, we uh, the western side of the main island, um, the heat has been uh, so bad over the last couple of weeks that um, within their river system, the fish started dying. So they sent their children out to go and collect the fish. Um, they mentioned there were some other things like crabs that started surfacing up to uh, the top of the river, the surface of the river. Um, and of course, the, the children went and got those, uh, those uh, river animals and uh, they were uh, consumed for, for dinner. But that is, these are the kinds of uh, situations that at community level they are seeing and they're experiencing, but perhaps they, they don't necessarily have the platform uh, to be able to voice some of these experiences. And so one of the challenges that continues uh, to be faced by communities uh, here at the ground level is there is the challenge of linking their daily experiences to the science of climate change, which often dominates uh, regional and international talks around what is happening, um, even in terms of the economic impacts that it may have. But at ground level here in the Pacific, these are very hard realities uh, that our people are uh, facing uh, on a daily basis, uh, the, seeing the changes within their environment, whether it's um, you know, uh, in their river systems, in their forests, um, they are they are not just um, they are not just live experiencing these changes, but I think that there there isn't enough avenues through which they can actually express it. So with COP26 happening next uh, month, I know that the world is gathering and there are many people, uh, experts who will be there talking about climate strategies and responses. Um, but I think that there is a need for some of these stories um, and uh, experiences to be voiced out there, because otherwise, if we don't have the stories that are coming from our people, uh, what it, it becomes this sort of, um, it becomes something that doesn't have that human connection to it. So we can be talking about the numbers, you know, the, the science around it, which is very important. Um, but I think the one of the things that we need to be highlighting is that uh, on at ground level, uh, our people are actually experience, experiencing firsthand um, the way that climate change is impacting their daily lives and their survival and that of their children. Thank you so much for that. Um... Mariana, that's again really helpful. And Grace, um, you were involved at COP25, presumably in telling some of those stories. Do you want to share your perspective on this question? Yeah, thank you very much, Vinaka Vakalevo. Um, your Grace, Archbishop Peter Chong, wonderful to, to hear your, um, your climate leadership. And Mariana, thank you so much for um, the input. Uh, very helpful. and really brings me back to actually COP25, where I felt this was in Madrid. Uh, and I can really identify with those sentiments of, you know, the, the, re the hard realities on the ground, as you say, Mariana, and the, the science and the gaps, you know, the, the technocratic conversations that can happen in um, the climate uh, convention as, as it does, right? Um, and this is, why it's so important amongst the, you know, the, the high level negotiations that the role of the church and representatives uh, of you know, non-government uh, agencies are there in the negotiation rooms um, as much as possible. And it is possible with this particular convention because it makes it uh, possible through the Paris Agreement to have non-state actors to participate uh, in these uh, negotiations or help the framing of these negotiations with, you know, these hard, you know, stories from the ground. Having said that, you know, there are a lot of things that get washed away and there's a lot of power in those rooms. And for me, you know, one of my ob observations was back in, you know, in 2019 is that really 
for a start, just to be in COP, that's a privilege, right? And with that privilege is great responsibility. We are essentially emissaries. We are messengers uh, of, of my people. I'm a messenger of my community and to relay what are the concerns? These are the, these are the facts on the ground concerns, you know? Um, and, and for me, that's, you know, that's a very big responsibility to make sure that one's message and uh, stake is very, very clear. But I mean, you know, the, at the end of the day, this is, this is uh, you know, it's a state making treaty. So political heads are there representing us, right? And to go back to the question relating to, um, you know, what, his grace mentioned as well with uh, the impacts of climate change through extraction communities at sea level rise, as well as what you said, Mariana, one of the issues that must be fought for and, and really must be fought for is the loss and damage issues that didn't really make it over the line in the last COP and must um, this time round have an absolute substantive uh, impact on the uh, climate change negotiations. And this is really important because loss and damage isn't just about you know, monetary um, demands or um, proposals from developing countries who are on the front lines of climate change and of course are the, not at all the contributors of CO2 impacts. But you know, this is not, not only about a financial package, this is about non uh, monetary damage as well, uh, such as um, the displacement of people. You know, His Grace talked about that, you know, when governments make decisions based on very unreliable uh, environment impact assessments or completely, you know, with commercial stakes, um, putting that in front of communities and, of course, the climate. This is also, you know, this, this impacts us locally and loss and damage one of the loss and damage, you know, pipelines is international, regional, national, and local. And the criticism I would say from from you know in in this in this context, uh, and certainly in you know in in what we know is going on in our you know Pacific Island nations is that our own local governments must you know adhere to our own you know, protecting our environment, protecting our communities, protecting our people. So, you know, it, it starts in the home. And, and I think this is, this is happening. Uh, and with, you know, voices coming from the church, which is an extremely powerful and important um, uh, stakeholder in climate change negotiations and can and should not be underestimated so i'm very very happy to have this discussion uh, in this context because the role of the church a faith-based organization um that's connected to evidence-based with climate change impacts uh is is absolutely important in going you know moving forward in how we are going to um uh, you know manage prevention, uh, disaster resilience, and recovery in the future. Thank you, Grace. That's so helpful and uh, begins to move our conversation into the, the, the area of what it is that the region needs from um, COP26. That's so helpful. Um, just uh, before we explore that a bit further, we'll go next to Chris, who's got uh, experience of Papua New, New Guinea and connections there, um, and uh, just bring your perspective onto this question, Chris. Thank you. You'll need to unmute, Chris. Unmuted. <clears throat> yes. Um, obviously, I can't speak for Pacific Islanders. Um, however, the challenges uh, affecting the Pacific Islands are also, of course, of concern to the various diaspora in the UK who have family in the Pacific. Many of them are settled in the southwest of England, which is warmer. Um, all of the first three speakers have covered some of the topics which I've got here. Um, my chairman, uh, Dr. Roy Smith, spent some time studying coral gardening and um, coral bleaching, uh, which he mentions. He says that the warmer and more acidic 
oceans can result in coral bleaching and a knock-on impact can be the destruction of nursery ecosystems for fish and other marine species. Uh, and fish also may migrate away from traditional fishing grounds. Um, uh, another factor which of course has affected many in uh, Kiribati and Papua New Guinea is um, that um, rising sea levels um, do cause out-migration, relocation as islanders, especially younger generations seeking opportunities elsewhere. Um, interestingly, Michael Walsh, speaking for Kiribati, he's married to a chiefly person, um, and he himself is the honorary consul. He says, for us, for low-lying islands, the dangers are from king tides when the salt water flows over the land and into wells. So the land, as has been noted, becomes increasingly saline and less productive. And I think the same occurs in the Solomon Islands too. Uh, and local erosion and accretion uh, from more frequent and severe hurricanes also. Um, Catherine Uche was present in uh, Exeter Cathedral and Kate Mycea, daughter of a bishop, spoke very movingly and illustrated um, the, the, the conditions on their home island by showing us a picture of a beautiful church um, in all its glory and then some time later underwater just stumps of its foundations remaining. Those I think are the main challenges I would wish to mention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, uh, we'll go lastly to Samson on this question and then move on to um, the particular asks for COP26. Samson, thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you, those of you that have spoken um, earlier. Uh, the points that I raised uh, are really heartbreaking for a Fijian that lives in the EU now and to hear firsthand um, the Archbishop and Moana. You all know that tomorrow the G20 is meeting here in Rome. So Greta Thunberg and her team will be protesting here from Saturday. So it's, it's, it's uh, something that as a Pacific Islander, and I know that many of us that live away from home, can't help but feel the frustration of the disconnect there is in all these meetings, the G20, we've had a climate G20 ministers, environmental ministers meeting here in June, July in Naples. And here we will have the heads of government, you know, Biden will be here and everyone else in the team, and then we'll have the, the COP. It's just the, the feeling of frustration that we as islanders here in these countries who have become citizens of these countries, this G20, part of the G20 countries that have contributed 75% in the rise uh, in global temperatures and in carbon dioxide, we have produced that. And the, the, the horrible uh, uh, realization that we are contributing to the very powers that are destroying our other homes in, in the Pacific. And so the, the challenges uh, that we meet, that I, I'm in contact with family in Fiji repeatedly every day. And some of the, the problems are what we have mentioned here today, the rise of the relocations, the, the change in water temperatures, which has seen many islands in Fiji lose their, 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 their means of life, as far as the reefs are concerned and the ecological um, part of their livelihood. There's also one thing that I've noticed that I need to, that I'd like to raise here. And this is directly linked to the major church groups in Fiji and the pandemic last year or this year, is the danger of conspiracy theories that play into our own people's minds at home or that many of our own people believe in, because many don't believe in, in, in climate change as well, even if the signs are there. And this is a place where the churches can play a very, very, very strong role because very often in places like Fiji there is a science versus religion uh, uh, going on. Uh, the many of the educated people from Fiji that spoke out against vaccinations, against the pandemic, treating it with all sorts of remedies which has resulted in, in what has happened. So 
the role of religious groups in Fiji, and Fiji is a, is, is a place that has probably one of the largest densities of all types of religious groups at the moment, I think. What is counterproductive is many of those groups are promoting a vision of climate change as something that is being promoted by, of course, uh, a conspiracy theory from, from uh, well-to-do countries, and it's another way of recolonizing the islands. So what we need, I think, to address is to really take the bull by the horns, and uh, it's courageous, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of courage from church leaders to stand up and tell their congregations, you know, that this is not uh, something invented to, to suppress you, this is happening. We need to join and band together and fight this together as a group and to use theology you know to 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 to, to spearhead you know the fight from our very own islands because i can see the indifference from here you know as part of the french diplomatic community we will go in we hosted the paris uh, um, cop uh, meeting 21 a few years back to be very honest nothing has really changed what is going to affect us here in, in, in Europe is when the refugees are going to start coming in. We already have refugees, but when the climate refugees begin to arrive, are we ready to take our responsibility and say, yes, we contributed to the problem, we need to address it. And France has contributed to this problem largely in the Pacific. I'm not going to mince my words about it. Uh, the nuclear testing issues, and they still have territories in New Caledonia, Tahiti, and Wallace and Futuna. So their responsibility to climate change has to be, they have to be at the forefront of this debate and with headway into this debate as well. But like many other countries, I think not enough is being done. And it's heartbreaking to hear Mariana talk about what's happening in Fiji, right down to that micro level. That there's also another point uh, very quickly that also we need to look at the hypocritical government policy that is coming from Fiji, is that we have our prime minister standing in front of everyone declaring that we are in a climate crisis, but as the archbishop has mentioned, they're dredging the rivers. People are destroying atolls to build, you know, the link between tourism, mass tourism, these luxury hotels in Fiji and the total destruction of Fiji's beachfronts and islands. And so we need to come clean as well from, from Fiji, you know, especially, especially for regarding those we vote into government and the, and the policies that they have, this hypocritical stance that they've had. So uh, I'm not going to take in much time anymore, but uh, I hope I've answered uh, your question. That's uh, really helpful. And, and you've moved us into the next area of the discussion, which, as we've been saying, is that both around what it is that the Pacific Island communities most need from COP26, but also how communities of faith can amplify those, those calls for urgent action. So we're going to go back to, to Grace initially. You've already raised the issue of reparations. Anything else that uh, you think um, needs to be gained from COP26 by Pacific Island communities? Um, thank you. And once again, some great points, uh, you know, raised uh, in this discussion so far, which also tells us, you know, this is a wicked problem. There is not one, one solution. There are, there has to be uh, many different ways of approaching um, what we need as a Pacific Island nation, but I mean, Pacific Island region. And having said that, you know, even although we are a region, we are all going to be impacted quite differently. Right. There are, you know, some uh, island nations that are, you know, above just two meters above sea level. Tuvalu is one of them. Uh, we have atolls which are disappearing, you know, and and so we are all going to have very different needs in approaching uh, the impacts of climate change as a Pacific Island region. Um, so this is also a very it's a multi pronged approach how we approach as a region united together and I think if anything that is powerful is that the Pacific Island community like they did with the nuclear uh, testing policy stand together as one community that's a very powerful um, powerful diplomacy and Pacific Island diplomacy uh, government and non governmental Again, the church has played a very important role during their nuclear testing policies in the 60s and 70s, uh, played a very powerful role in, um, in, in that diplomacy. The same 
uh, role and you know guts and passion is also applied here I have to say with climate change so if there's anything you know we can get we must give the same um, united diplomacy and climate leadership and really you know put our voices as both you know political and community voices together in ensuring and again, I'm an advocacy for the policy of loss and damage because that, you know, what we're talking about here is ultimately going to going to be, you know, coming back to that. Our loss and damage policy in Article 8 of the Paris Agreement and how that's going to impact, you know, the damage that's going to be caused or is caused, quite frankly, uh, as a result of slow onset climate change caused by, you know, the us as humans, as well as you know, climate disruption caused naturally. So, I mean, if, if, you know, this is what we have to give our, our hard and soft diplomacy, as well as, you know, demand uh, that our, our political negotiations regarding loss and damage, that that goes over the line in, in this year's COP26. Thanks, Grace. Uh, we're gonna go to Archbishop Peter next. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, from what uh, we want uh, COP23 to hear from, uh, from uh, Pacific Island people is uh, our voice. Our voice needs to uh, get inside the mainstream uh, conversation because uh, it's not only our voice, it's the voice of vulnerable communities that are affected by climate change and uh, like extractive industries and uh, yeah, generally extractive industries. So we, we have like, yeah, climate change is affecting us, but something is also affecting us uh, right now. Uh, and instantly, and that is the, the extractive industries that are damaging livelihood, uh, uh, taking away sustenance, food and uh, economic sustenance from uh, our uh, uh, coastal communities, those who are on the river banks and uh, also in the islands where extractive industries uh, take place. We are going to hold uh, like a side cop, uh, side, uh, even to COP26 here in Fiji in order to raise our voice. Uh, and it's said that uh, I hear that uh, the Fiji representation to the COP26 is a 39 member team. It's said that since uh, the COP23, which was uh, hosted by Fiji, there is very little consultation and the voices of uh, these vulnerable communities uh, getting into the consultation. Our team from Fiji is going to COP26, but uh, I, I'm listening around, but they said that we, there was none, nothing done to listen to the voices of victims of uh, climate change and the extractive industries. For, for church, this is important that, uh, you know, uh, and using our theology scripture and the development of theology uh, that, uh, and I've just come back from uh, speaking to a, a group of religious congregations and, and that we have to bring in our faith here. And uh, I use four, ways of uh, framing the voice of uh, the victims, because these are the people directly affected by this. And we need to bring this voice into the front. Uh, using our faith resources, the first thing is that God takes the side of victims of injustice. And, uh, and uh, in the history of salvation, God is always on the side of the victims of uh, oppression and injustice. We just have to go back to the Exodus story. 
then Jesus himself locates his mission with the, the victims of injustice uh, uh, in his ministry. The development of theology, you know, also highlights this. We just uh, have uh, the the theology that developed around after the Holocaust is a good uh, uh, theology to go back to at this time because uh, that is a major catastrophe in the human history. And out of that developed a theology that took the side of victims and to empower them to be subjects of their history. Now. Uh, so that they can speak for themselves and uh, and be their own agents of uh, amplifying their own uh, struggle. Uh, but a church that really takes the side of the victims. Now, in other developments of theology and philosophy, the post-colonial theory or the post-colonial writing also speak of this, you know, how you know, the uh, proponents of uh, post-colonial uh, theory and writing, they say that, you know, uh, 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 for many years, we have been represented by Westerners in terms of uh, representing us because they have the privilege of uh, language writing and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, we have not found our voice just because even right now in Fiji, most of the history are written by uh, Westerners, uh, expatriates, white people, and they write about us and, uh, and they represent us just because uh, we do not, we, earlier on, we did not have the privilege of uh, reading and writing. And so the colonizers and the Westerners took the center stage and uh, they represented us, told our story uh, from their own worldview. And uh, so a good example of this is uh, here in Fiji, European writers describe our history, write our history, uh, say that uh, Fijians are heathens, uncivilized cannibals, uh, that uh, th that indigenous peoples become the object of their writing. So one of the challenges and the critic of uh, post-colonial writers is that uh, that uh, we have to change this. We have to allow victims or those on the under side of the world to tell their stories, to tell their, uh, to reveal the truth about their experience. And, uh, and it is this that uh, one of the projects of the post-colonial writers. Uh, so, uh, Thank you. and this is still happening today be uh, because we are not allowed that space to tell our own story and experience. Some people have broken this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, barrier. So I'm thinking of uh, Catherine from Marshall, who has become uh, famous in uh, these discussions because of her poetry. So uh, stories, uh, symbolic uh, language, uh, symbols uh, are the the the. the, the the, the language that will move the hearts of people. And if you can touch the hearts of people, and it is the, the, the stories of uh, victims of climate change and other ecological destruction that needs to come up in the front and enter into this COP23, COP26, you know, to interrupt and uh, to awaken and to bring out the real true stories, you know? Uh, it's this kind of language that COP26 needs in order to evoke a response from policymakers and politicians and uh, uh, 
because it, it, uh, it's these stories that will really touch the hearts of people and evoke a response and, and bring about a change in the policy maker. So it, Thank you. Uh, we have to allow for this uh, yeah. voice to come. And I'd like to explore that further by bringing in uh, Isabella Naiduki, um, who is an indigenous Fijian scholar and writer who's um, joined our panel. Isabella, um, you're very welcome um, here as well. And I wonder whether you could respond to a question that we had in the chat from Tricia, which is about um, how do local stories of uh, these experiences get known? Um, is there a platform that's in use and accessible, which other allies can use to promote and support? And are there models of local community mobilization and uh, ways in which these can be supported by faith communities? Hello, you're very welcome. Thank you, everyone, and thank you. Um, I'm I'm actually, I'm actually based here in the UK, so I wouldn't be able to speak on uh, those who are back home who are mobilizing on the ground. Uh, Mariana would be the best person to kind of engage with. But um, speaking from my own personal experience, for those of us who are in the diaspora, especially here in the UK, um, the utilization of technology, social media platforms, or face-to-face -face meetings and um, highlighting the issues that our communities back home, those of us who are still connected to our families back home, those of us who are trying to push for, um, you know, just wider awareness of the impact of the climate crisis. And I think that's another thing that we need to kind of highlight as well is the language that we use. A lot of times I feel like just referring to it as climate change minimizes the impact that it has on those who are directly impacted by the effects of the climate crisis. And so, yeah, those, those insights that we've had from Grace, especially, I think is, is something that to take on. How, how do we, the, with the question, how do we mobilize in terms of using like storytelling? Those things are changing as well. Um, I would think that generations to come and um, sorry if this is going off on a tangent, but if we were to look at the impact of how do we pass on the traditional knowledges um, that we have and how is that impacted by what we're facing with climate crisis, um, things that we might be able to, our generation now might be able to refer to in terms of like physicalities, those are being eroded. So how do we change our stories to involve um, the impact that all of us are facing with regards to climate, climate crisis and how does that um, build in to how do, you know, coping mechanisms? How do we uh, educate and inform Inaka? Thank you so much, Isabella. Um, and uh, as you suggested, perhaps we'll bring Mariana back in at this point um, to also talk about local stories and how um, it's possible to ensure that those are heard. Is Mariana still there with us? Sorry. That's um, all right. Thank you. I guess I, I don't really have a suggestion that I can think of right now. I mean, the stories are here. Um, the experience, as mentioned before, the realities on the ground are very real, but I get kind of disillusioned with how many times our stories have to be told. How many times do we need to repeat ourselves to the international community that this is affecting our people uh, at various levels? How do, you know, um, it, it's my question is, is the international community even listening? Um, and how many times do we have to go to these international conventions and meetings uh, voicing our cause, whether it's through governments, which uh, as Samson has mentioned earlier, the Fijian government really has a lot to answer for in terms of, on the one hand, being advocates for climate, um, but on the other hand, 
uh, opening up our, our vanua, our land and our seas to extraction companies for the sole purpose of economic growth or gain. Um, and especially using the pandemic now to justify some of the things that they are now opening the country up to. So, you know, it, these kinds, um, I understand that this is the way that the world works, but it is, there is also an element of frustration because we are seeing our communities suffer here on the ground. And as much as, you know, these strategic talks uh, need to happen uh, amongst, you know, our nations um, with more powerful nations sort of leading the agendas and the way that um, strategies are to be outplayed um, with, within vulnerable regions. Um, it's, it does become uh, an issue of having to repeat over and over the fact that the, digni the dignity of our people and our future generations is at risk here. And that you know the the churches um, have a have a prophetic responsibility to be that voice um, in these uh, global talks around uh, stewardship, taking uh, being caretakers of our our world, our environment, and from the Pacific region, um, the indigenous knowledge and traditions that have been lost. Uh, due to uh, issues such as colonization. Um, but you know, you still see that there is, uh, um, there is evidence of hope where you know, um, traditional knowledge um, and sustainable practices in terms of how we engage, how our ancestors engaged with the environment is beginning to find uh, its ground in some areas here. Um, but even with all this work that we are doing, I just, I, I find it a little, um, not a little, but I do find it concerning that we as Pacific Islanders are having to scream and shout and jump up and down, telling the, the international community that uh, this, that climate change is real and that it really is affecting our people. Um, I, I don't know how many more COP meetings uh, over the next five, 10 years where, we, where you know, very little changes. Um, I, I think the church uh, at this stage uh, through our national churches uh, within the region as well as the Pacific Conference of Churches has been uh, quite uh, doing quite a lot in terms of advocacy. We have uh, our general secretary and one of our youth um, who will be in Glasgow uh, sharing some of the stories from our local communities um, here in our maritime islands, uh, as well as around the Pacific region. So th that might be an avenue in which a big meeting like COP26, uh, where the church, because of the church's influence and reach into communities, they are a we have that agency and the capacity to gather some of those stories, some of these experiences of our people and bring it to uh, places such as COP26. But again, uh, that question that I have is, are people listening? And do we, how many times do we have to keep on uh, telling our stories? Because it does become tiring and our people are just trying to survive. Um, and uh, we really need to see change um, urgently uh, so that in terms of um, the loss and damage um, that I believe Grace was mentioning before, uh, which you know that is a, that that does need to happen in terms of what has already been lost. But um, how do we also uh, ensure that we are doing the best that we can to safeguard and not lose uh, any more of what has been lost in terms of whether it's our agency within our own countries, our stories, our practices. Um, and uh, the cultures and traditions that form our, our identities, especially when it comes to displacement, uh, when some of our people have no choice but to leave their island homes or to leave their places because of rising sea levels and other issues uh, impacting their livelihoods. How can we safeguard these and not, um, you know, just be, uh, just be kind of like, um, you know, 
in the future there will be a compensation in terms of what we have lost? Can we really put a financial amount to losing one's identity and cultural heritage? Uh, that is what is at stake for many of our Pacific communities. And I think, um, yeah, I think as, as, a re as national, regional and international communities, our diasporic communities overseas, uh, there is a real sense of urgency in terms of how we, how we, how we respond to this and um, how we can get the international community to listen and respond accordingly to what we value. Um, being a capitalistic system that we that we live in in today's modern world, I understand that money and finance is very important, economics, um, but in terms of our own indigenous values, it's our cultural identities, traditions, and so forth that are um, being lost. And I, I don't think we can put a uh, an, a financial amount. Uh, or dollar sign to that kind of loss to our peoples. Thank you so much, Mariana. That's very powerful. I'm going to go next to um, Samson for more on stories. Um, and then I'm going to go to Chris and pick up a question from the chat. And then we'll um, uh, give all of the panelists an opportunity for a, a, a closing um, comment or response. So hopefully we can pick up on um uh, all of your thoughts at that point but um samson you're also a storyteller any um thoughts from your perspective on this question well as um as someone that's writing uh, stories and i do it regularly there is a responsibility now in front of us those of us that are storytellers and that are pacific island islanders we have a responsibility to tell these stories and to use our privilege and our accessibility, whichever, whatever they are, into telling these stories and to making it public. It's, um, it's interesting because we come from a, a tradition, we come from a people where storytelling has been part of our civilization for thousands of years. And it seems, it was an oral based uh, storytelling uh, tradition. It seems as if the disconnect has once again happened now that we've started and learned how to write. So the responsibility for those of us that are writing now is to bring this tradition and make it accessible to everyone. These stories that talk about the dangers we are facing in the islands, not only what is written, but what is also for those of us that are involved more or less in film and television to see ways in which we can broach the subject and especially at a time like this where television and platforms are exploding all over and everyone has access to a laptop even their telephone to watch things and to read things we have it's uh, unprecedented that we have so much tools available now to create awareness and I ask myself the question, and I'm probably one of the first that's guilty about this, what are you doing about telling the stories of what's happening back home? And just to come back to the storytelling tradition, to tie it into what is Fijian tradition, is that, and religion, is that we have lots of stories that recount how the environment is preserved in Fiji by those that practice the old religions and the practices that they used. And tragically, that has been cut short when European religion was introduced. And when one goes back to the storytelling, the stories that rest, uh, that remain of that particular time, it was almost always centered around preservation of the environment. So many of what we call superstitions in the Pacific cultures, stories about the witches coming to bite your toes if you don't wash your feet after you've been to the sea, all these have been centered around preserving the environment. You're not allowed to scream or to shout when you're in, in your plantations, when you go up to the forest, respect the forest, because if no, you'll wake the spirits up. Now, the storytelling from that, I had that as a child growing up, but that is slowly and dangerously disappearing because now we've replaced it with what? And are we replacing the storytelling tradition with perhaps the stories that come? And this is where the religious responsibility and the responsibility of those 
in religion uh, and church leaders have a responsibility to tell the stories that correspond with the realities of Fiji's environment and Fiji's past. And as the, uh, the Archbishop has rightfully said, colonization of Fiji, so a, a real break in traditions which we are trying to repair and put together and through which as storytellers, we have a responsibility as well. So that we, the, the, the picture we get right now is one that's very pessimistic and especially for those of us that come from the Pacific. However, it is also a time where we also have all the tools, many, many tools available to use to tell these stories and to turn the tide if possible. And as Mariana has, has said, you know, the frustration and the desperation sometimes that comes from talking about meeting after meeting after meeting, international meetings, I think the pandemic, COVID-19, has sort of created an impact on how even the first world countries like Europe has seen uh, how a disease can eventually bring these great powers down to a standstill. And on the climate, things are beginning to change here because you probably saw in the news that Germany and Belgium had massive floods that killed over hundreds of people. So the, the, the shock and awareness is beginning to come, it's to come. And so we must be relentless in our efforts. And we come back to our policymakers in, in Fiji. Who do we elect? Who do we vote into government that will make the real, who are making or who are going to take the right decisions to, to, to stem or to be heard internationally and not just see COP26 as another way in which to get money to finance a government that is terribly bankrupt at the moment. So as a storyteller, yes, our, our, and I, I see that Grace agrees because I think we're in the storytelling industry as well and uh, Isabella as well. We have stories to tell, but uh, we have to fight to tell them, to bring them out there. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. Um, so I'm going to go quickly to Chris um, to pick up a question uh, that's coming from Kath Juice in the chat. Um, Chris, as a way to share more stories of the reality of climate change, what is the potential for more sustained church partnerships or church links between Pacific and UK to share human stories of resilience and tragedy to inform our prayers to give greater power to our advocacy? Um, yes, the small mission agencies related to the Pacific, and they are unique, I think, in the Church of England, um, in that there are two small agencies, Melanesian Mission UK and Papua New Guinea Church Partnership, who relate to just one province in the Anglican Communion, rather than being large like USPG and CMS. Um, and they do have particular focused gatherings at which to which Pacific Islanders in this country are invited. And the same goes for Izuki, which reaches out to people who are not just Christians, but to everybody and of all denominations. And we hold, we've held many events um, uh, at my church of St. Philip in the Earth Court Road, because I got into all this via my uh, a vicar who was had been a, a, a Kiwi who had been a missionary in New Zealand, and we've we've held uh, Pacific Island Society events there. We are all Tuvalu by Sarah Hemstock, the academic um, Solomon Islands um, coral gardening. Oh, you name it. Um, we've we've had over the years events focusing on all these things, and they're always cogent. Uh, questions asked at our AGMs when we have a keynote speaker, um, it got quite uh, quite uh, animated. I remember once when we had a presentation by um, a diplomat and about World War, you know, the end of the, the anniversary of the end of World War One, and I mean, quite a lot of the people present in the Pacific Islands. Well, it wasn't our war, um, you know, perfectly valid thing to say it was. But on the other hand, others, like many Fijians, feel honoured uh, to come to, uh, and, and be part of the British Army and have been honoured themselves. It's difficult. We try to listen to all voices. And the Melanesian mission is doing an excellent job, as I'm sure um, Catherine will testify, by working with climate change scientists and also with the British High Commission. 
and the British High Commissions have opened across the Pacific um, uh, since Brexit. Whereas when we joined the European Union uh, years ago, they all closed down because everything was, all aid was then, then um, multilateral and went via Brussels. So it's all very interesting, the new things which are happening. And I think we all want to help in different ways. I don't know whether that partly answers uh, Catherine's uh, question. Or I'm not. sure it does. Thank, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so th this is a really important conversation and um, some um, really powerful and significant um, insights that have been shared. Um, but we are now sort of overrunning. So we'll, we'll go around the panel um, for some closing comments. And we'll begin with Grace, as um, she's been wanting to come in for some time. So thank you. <laughs> uh, it's so wonderful to have this discussion. I Look, I, I want to go back to, first, I want to say His Grace and Mariana really are the connection right now for us. Um, as as um, representing the facts on the ground from the Pacific region and specifically Fiji. But one of the things I want to touch on there is, you know, first story, narrative and agency. Going first of all, agency. The Pacific Island region have agency. There is no doubt about it. We cannot come into climate change from a voice of victims. We must approach the discussions of climate disruption and climate change as a voice of power and agency. And this is clearly evidenced now when the 18 Pacific Island Member Forum made it very clear that our maritime boundaries will not shift as a result of rising sea levels. And this is absolutely important to understand this because this preserves our sovereign states and our ocean boundaries. And from a storytelling perspective, we must really remind our generation living in the Pacific region, as well as in the diaspora, what this story means. It means not just our indigenous, it, not, it means not just our food security, but it also means, you know, that we are a stubborn bunch of people with incredible pride, we know our territory, and we will not be compromised even when our environment is, uh, is challenging us to this point. And this is, this is extremely important, powerful agency message that we must you know, remember. And, and, and symbolisms um, you know, such as our ocean and policies such as maintaining our maritime boundaries is not only political, it is spiritual. And, and, and we must you know, remind ourselves of this. When it comes to storytelling, um, you know, we have to work from the inside out, right? There are, we have a generation of Pacific Island youths. We have a booming Pacific Island population of youths, uh, which are taking over from our elderly population. And we have a legacy and a responsibility to make sure that our Pacific Island generation understands their story. There's no point talking about it to the international community. Our, you know, our, our responsibility is our people and making sure that our future climate change leaders know what the story is. This is absolutely important for agency. This is absolutely important for policy. This is important for our indigenous traditions and, and, and leadership. So, I mean, our job, I believe, and I strongly, you know, have this conviction is through, you know, where we see gaps of, uh, you know, political leaders, here is an opportunity again from faith-based organization to come in and pick up those, those leadership gaps uh, within our communities in the Pacific region. Um, and, and this, and there is a, there are a lot of leadership gaps. I mean, his grace touched on this, Mariana picked on this, and, and here is an opportunity now to really mobilize uh, ourselves from a, you know, faith-based organizations and work together on an ecumenical level uh, and community level to really um, show, you know, our agency. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Tremendous. Thank you, Grace. Um, and let's go to Isabella next. I just wanted to say thank you for providing this platform and being able to allow us to speak and allow us to hear each other. I've been really inspired and encouraged just hearing um, you know, the sharings from His Grace and also from Mariana. They are the ones that we really need to be um, 
kind of deferring to rather than those of us who are out here in the diaspora uh, speaking on their behalf. So just a big Vinakaka live to all of you and also to the other participants here. Vinaka. Thank you. Um, Samson. Yes, um, as Isabella has raised, you know, the connection to Fiji right now is His Excellency and uh, the Archbishop and Mariana on the ground. So the, um, we, with privilege and power, and as Grace has mentioned, um, have a responsibility. And we have a responsibility to influence those around us as well. So I, we do it in all our different ways, different ways where we can, eh? depending on where we are and what we do. But as Pacific Islanders, there's also the need for us to create in our communities, to remove the mentality, as has been mentioned, of being victims. And we come to these meetings, not as victims, but as equals to the rest of the world. And we need out there, and we need to advocate with our own people and support them to, as Grace has said, to produce the next generation of leaders so that we can stand and speak for ourselves. I think we have very often, Fiji's decolonization happened 51 years ago. We have had a change of leadership many times in Fiji. What we saw as a united Pacific against nuclear testing, which was very successful, is no longer the Pacific we have today. We have fractured leadership in the Pacific and in Oceania, which we need to repair. We saw the crisis and uh, what happened in the Pacific Island Forum meetings, where the Micronesians were pushed to the side, marginalized to favor some other candidate from within the Polynesian Triangle uh, to take over leadership, which has caused the Northern Pacific Micronesians to leave, to want to leave and create their own organizations. What we need to do is to say, okay, we have many outsiders that have come over and come in and spoken for us. We need to stand up to now, get heal the rifts that exist within us and go beyond that and to prevent or to present a united uh, stand or stand in meetings like we have coming up uh, in COP26. So without this, Fiji will be alone shouting out in the wilderness the other Micronesians will be doing their own thing. And so we will not be presenting this strength we have in numbers because we also vote in the international organizations for the United Nations and our vote counts when it comes to major issues because a vote is a vote. And so we need to get out there to our own people and to say, okay, we have been victims, we have been colonized, no, but we are here today where our islands are going under. They are going under. And we need to confront the reality in front of us that when Tuvalu and Kiribati goes underwater, where, do, where does their maritime territory go? Do they retain it as refugees in Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji? Or does it go to the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans? So from this point of view, where we see that we are going to, as, Ma, as Mariana said, we are going to shout in all the meetings, that how do we get them to hear us? What do we have to do to get them to stand up and say, yes, you have a point. And that I think can only be achieved if all the Pacific Island countries, you know, upped their game, you know, stepped up and said, let's get down to work. And that is not being done at the moment. And that we need to advocate. And the churches play a huge role in that as well. Because very often in Fiji, what I've heard and what I've been going down is that the churches have sometimes, and not just the traditional churches, because in Fiji, you have a kaleidoscope of religious movements that is mind boggling, but it is what it is. And they have to be involved. So how do we get them involved when they are promoting, let's leave everything to God, God will solve the problem. So there's a lot of work to be done. And if there has been a lesson that we've learned from COVID in Fiji, so I'm in touch with them, is that it has sort of turned the population away from the monetary economy to go back to the land and to say, okay, we can do something about it. Once again, we can exploit it, but how do we keep it? Well, 
I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Samson. Some really important points being made there. Thank you. Um, we'll go now to Mariana and then we'll end with uh, Archbishop Peter. Thank you. No, thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I, I do agree with uh, my fellow speakers in regards to um, the agency that we do have as Pacific Islanders, uh, not only to engage um, at higher levels of dialogue, um, but also to uh, find ways of standing together in solidarity around this issue. And for the church, uh, I'm not sure if uh, any of you have heard this, but there is uh, something that we have here in Fiji uh, called reweaving the ecological mat. Um, so it's it's a prog it, it is a program um, that affirms indigenous and Christian religious ecological frameworks, so knowledge, ethics, and practices that can contribute uh, a lot to addressing the ecological crisis uh, that we are currently facing around the world and in our region. Um, the Pacific Theological College principal, um, I'll, I'll just read a quote from him uh, in regards to sustainable development and the issues around creation. Uh, he stated that the narrative of sustainable development right now is money orientated. It's all about profit and increase. It's not about the sacredness and spirituality that surrounds the ecology. And so in changing the story, how can we bring in the indigenous understanding that everything is sacred? And for this to be part of the dialogue that we have within the Pacific and the wider international community. Uh, as a child, Fijian child of the diaspora, I did grow up overseas and I, was, I received my education overseas before moving back to my country five years ago. Uh, I do have to say that uh, the lenses, um, my lenses changed uh, uh, quite a lot um, when I was doing work uh, around eco-theology uh, over in Australia and addressing, you know, attending the protests, speaking out, uh, advocating in regards to what is happening to the Pacific. Um, but when I returned to my home country, you know, things changed because at community level, especially within our rural, our urban settings, like settlements, um, those things that we are doing overseas in, in the diaspora as Pacific Islanders, which are really important here uh, on the ground, you know, it's a different dynamic that is, be, that is happening. And so I've had to learn how to shift from that to this, to what I've been um, experiencing, uh, not only experiencing, but I've learned so much in coming back home that some of the assumptions that I had made um, or ideas that I had uh, look from the outside looking in had to shift significantly in regards to uh, the, the the subject of climate change and how we see it from the outside and what is actually being experienced on the ground level uh, throughout the country and as well as the region. Um, you know, so I think both perspectives are really important, the external, but as well as the internal uh, perspectives as Pacific Islanders. Um, but perhaps in uh, as a part of how we unpack our stories and we move forward in terms of the narrative around climate change, that that is something that uh, perhaps we need to do uh, a little bit more work on in terms of bridging, bringing these two perspectives together and uh, learning from one another so that we can perhaps find um, more uh, be better resolutions uh, in terms of how we engage with an international community, as well as our responsibilities to the Vanua, to you know, remembering and practicing some of the things that have sustained us as a people uh, throughout generations uh, of Pacific, uh, of our Pacific Islanders uh, throughout the region. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to engage with you all tonight. Um, uh, it's been a, an extremely uh, learning experience for myself. And thank you, Bella, for uh, inviting me on the panel. And it's been really nice uh, 
discussing all of this uh, with you all, uh, and especially hearing from uh, His Grace, the Archbishop Peter Loy Chung. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana, and thank you for your willingness to join us and for all that you've shared. Um, we are going to go to His Grace, uh, Archbishop Peter, um, for some closing thoughts. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, I just make two points. One is uh, the importance listening to the uh, speakers, the importance of listening or amplifying the voices of victims of climate change and vulnerable uh, ecological communities that uh, uh, unless we, we have to bring in this voice because uh, uh, we are, or they are forgotten many times, but we have to bring their voices and their stories inside. I totally agree with that. Uh, I read a book that was written by somebody, uh, the, the, it's called Crisis in Creation, and uh, he tells this uh, story that in uh, somewhere around in early 2000, there was a World Forum on Human Survival. And after that gathered together about over a thousand uh, scientists, biologists, and uh, and uh, church uh, theologians. At the end of the conference, the scientists, they got together and wrote a declaration to church leaders or re religious leaders of the world. Uh, and, and their statement was simple. They say, you know, we, we scientists, we can explain scientifically how we got here and what we need to do to, to reweave the mat, the ecological mat or how to get out. But they stated that, but we lack one thing, and that is the language to move people to act. And uh, it is there that they ask and urgently request the religious leaders to come on board with their uh, spiritual language and uh, faith symbols and uh, other people have written the, of the importance of the symbolic, artistic, you know, and symbolic, it's uh, uh, music, dance, poetry, rituals, because, and uh, stories, because these stories have the, the, the capacity to reach, to touch the hearts of people. If you don't touch the hearts of people, uh, you can't get a, a response. So this is where our narrative, the, the, just the experience and artistic, and uh, as I said, uh, Catherine from the Marshall Islands, the woman that's been uh, speaking a lot around the UN conferences on climate change, just because of her uh, poetry. So one, Two things. One is we have to bring in victims at the center. That's a very theological uh, framework, as I've said before. Then the language. What language do we use? It's these uh, stories, uh, symbolic ex or artistic expressions. Uh, Marina, Mariana has uh, spoken on the indigenous spirituality. Uh, these are the, 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 the language uh, that we need to bring in to touch or disturb or interrupt politicians. And then once we, if we can reach their heart, see the scientific language and the academic language uh, has that limitation. It, uh, it's academic, it's scientific, but you need a language that will move touch your heart and make you think. So th those are the two remarks that I want to make at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and a huge thanks to all of our panelists. Um, you have touched our hearts in uh, on so many different levels um, with all that you've shared. Um, it's been insightful and profound um, and deeply moving. So. Um, much thanks to Archbishop Peter, to Chris, 
to Isabella, to Mariana, to Grace and to Samson. Um, we are hugely grateful for, for all that you have shared. Um, this uh, uh, panel session has been recorded and um, we will uh, endeavour to get that up on our platforms as soon as possible and uh, you know, encourage you to uh, uh, share it with others um, in your network so that um, uh, the voices that we've heard today can be heard more widely at this time. Um, Catherine has also dropped into the chat uh, a link for the recording of the panel session that happened last week with artists from the Pacific region. And again, um, we would encourage you to watch and listen and share uh, if at all possible. Um, Catherine has also dropped into the chat details of uh, another environmentally themed workshop that we have coming up um, very soon on replanting our communities. And we do encourage you to look for that link um, and uh, to join us um, for that uh, important and significant discussion as well. Um, but uh, thank you, uh, as I say, so much to our panelists uh, today. It has been um, a deeply moving time hearing um, from each of you. Um, and uh, we will um, be emailing following this session to see whether um, some kind of uh, follow on uh, discussion after COP26 would be of um, value and support um, to you in terms of amplifying your voices and those of others um, in the region. Um, but uh, for today, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to everyone that's been on the call, everyone who shared questions, and uh, every blessing to you all with all that you're going to go on and do um, uh, today and uh, in the future too. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. Okay. Okay.